I entirely beg you, people and government of the DPR Korea. Have you ever imagined the unthinkable scenario of getting arrested for wearing your favorite pair of blue jeans? Well, that is the least of the weird things that happen in North Korea. Locked in a shroud of secrecy since the Korean War's armistice in 1953, North Korea, governed by leaders with shades of megalomania and paranoia, this East Asian nation thrives on isolation, limiting our understanding to the stories of spies and defectors. Here, we unveil 15 mind-bending and weird things that only exist in North Korea. Number 15. Prohibition on blue jeans and Western clothing. In fashion-forward North Korea, where style is not just a personal choice but a statement, blue jeans find themselves on the blacklist. Leader Kim Jong-un views them as more than denim. They symbolize American influence, something he's not eager to embrace. This strict dress code extends beyond jeans to a broader ban on Western attire. The official newspaper, Rodong Cinema, even featured a cautionary tale about North Korean teens experimenting with Western fashion trends. The government's message is clear. Guard against any signs of a capitalist lifestyle. The fashion police, or in this case the youth patrol, take their duty seriously. Anyone spotted flaunting blue jeans or other Western clothing items must wait by the roadside until the patrol completes its thorough inspection. Once the fashion misdemeanor is confirmed, violators are summoned to the Youth League office, where they must confess their style sins. The only way to return home? Someone has to offer them more suitable clothing. It's like a sartorial police drama playing out on the streets. Western apparel, including t-shirts, skirts, and suits, is a big no-no. Instead, North Koreans are encouraged to embrace their cultural roots by donning traditional Korean garments like handbox. So the next time you're curating your closet, remember that what's considered normal attire in your country might stir up some legal trouble in the fashion-centric streets of North Korea. Ever wondered how your wardrobe choices might speak louder than words in a nation with such a distinctive fashion code? Let's hear your comments below. Number 14. Three Generations of Punishment Policy In North Korea, breaking the law has very harsh consequences, regardless of social status. Unlike other nations where only the guilty face punishment, North Korea has a stringent penal system. This means that if you violate the law, it's not just you who gets into trouble. Your parents, grandparents, and children are also implicated. In certain cases, if the offender is not found, Family members might serve the sentence on their behalf. Numerous defector stories confirm the reality of this practice in North Korea. Under this policy, up to three generations of a family connected to a political offender may face immediate imprisonment or even death. These consequences, not part of the official legal system, stem from the Workers' Party's internal principles. Even children born behind prison walls face the same punishment and the relatives are left without an explanation for the investigation. Originating in 1948, when North Korea was founded, the practice of linking punishment to an offender's family had existed under the Hoseon Kingdom. North Korea's prison camps, especially Kwan Lee, known for their cruelty, aimed to instill terror to deter inmates from wrongdoing. Reports reveal these facilities are harsh, with prisoners enduring physical, verbal, and nutritional abuse, and even the offender's relatives facing mistreatment. In North Korea, even the most devoted citizens could find themselves in a labor camp for a transgression committed by their grandchild, such as damaging a photo of Kim Jong-un. Number 13. The Prohibition of International Phone Calls In North Korea, making international phone calls is a big no-no in the telecommunications world. The government tightly controls technology usage, especially concerning countries they consider adversaries. Despite having a whopping 3 million users on its popular mobile phone service, North Korea only greenlights local calls and gives a firm thumbs down to any international dialing. If ordinary North Koreans are caught using their cell phones to chat with family members who've made a run for it, they risk a one-way ticket to political prison camps or other cozy detention spots. Still, Many brave souls are tapping into North Korea's thriving underground private sector, even with the associated dangers. 
Traders are sneaking in all sorts of goodies, from SIM cards to mobile phones, courtesy of their friendly neighbor, China. Those living near the border can hop onto Chinese mobile networks and connect with folks abroad using these gadgets, often dubbed Chinese mobile phones. To dodge detection, savvy callers venture to remote, mountainous hideouts, adopting aliases and keeping their conversations short and sweet. This reduces the chances of calls getting intercepted or alerting the ever-watchful security personnel. Various studies confirm that the North Korean leadership views tight control over information as a nifty way to keep its citizens in check. By clamping down on foreign calls and cutting-edge communication tech, they aim to keep a lid on any news about serious human rights issues in the country. Now, here's a question to ponder. How far would you go to connect with your loved ones if making a simple phone call could land you in a political prison camp? Share your opinions in the comments section. Number 12. Caste System Based on Loyalty Songbun, or Chosen Songbun, serves as North Korea's intricate status assignment system, categorizing individuals based on their relatives' actions and their immediate ancestors' socio-political and economic context. With almost 50 subcategories, Songbun classifies North Koreans into three main castes, hostile, wavering, and core, determining their eligibility for opportunities and trustworthiness with responsibilities. This system significantly shapes career and educational paths, especially in joining Korea's ruling Workers' Party. Established through the May 1956 resolution and the Korean Workers' Party's extensive guidance project, Songbun divides people into three loyalty groups, friendly, neutral, and hostile troops, based on family history. The lowest status is assigned to those with backgrounds as landlords, lawyers, or Christian priests, while the highest status is granted to descendants of resistance fighters against Japanese occupation. Peasants, laborers, and factory workers also enjoy high status. Reflecting on CIA analyst Helen Louise Hunter's view, Songbun highlights North Korea's communists successfully overturning the pre-revolutionary social structure. Approximately 30% fall into the chosen class, 40% are considered average, and 30% are labeled undesirable. Security officers and party cadres meticulously update files on individuals every two years, starting at the age of 17. Number 11. Nasty Fertilizer. A serious food shortage is unfolding in North Korea, and the blame falls on various factors. The leadership's emphasis on military and nuclear pursuits, coupled with a lack of chemical fertilizer, has left the nation in a precarious situation, struggling to produce their own fertilizer, and hindered by sanctions from obtaining any externally, North Korea's farmers desperately need a solution. Meet the unconventional world of night soil. This term might sound euphemistic, but it involves farmers utilizing human waste as a fertilizer by spreading it across their fields. The concept of selling human waste gained traction around 2010 as the demand for this unconventional commodity skyrocketed. In 2014, Kim Jong-un officially directed his people to use livestock and human excrement to boost crop growth. Due to a shortage of animals, most of this fertilizing material came from people themselves. Surprisingly, human dung has gained a reputation as the creme de la creme of fertilizers, with some claiming it imparts a unique and delicious flavor to the vegetables it helps grow. This unusual agricultural practice has even led to instances where families share their feces with farmers who are struggling to produce enough on their own. However, it's essential to note the unsanitary nature of this approach. Reports from defectors reveal the potential health risks, with instances of intestinal worms among North Korean escapees making headlines. According to the Washington Post, some individuals have harbored intestinal parasites, reaching lengths of almost 10.6 inches. These parasites not only deplete essential nutrients, but also contribute to the deteriorating health of the population. Number 10. Traffic Conductors or Models Despite North Korea's well-documented governance issues and the hardships faced by its people, the country harbors some intriguing and peculiar facets. Take, for instance, the famed DPRK traffic girls, who have garnered such popularity that social media fan pages are dedicated to them. In the past, 
Many nations, including North Korea, employed individuals to manage traffic, especially in urban areas lacking traffic signals. Pyongyang, the capital, specifically selected unmarried, attractive, youthful, and slim women for this role. Today, the country's economic struggles and the leadership's prioritization of military spending over development mean that traffic lights aren't ubiquitous in the city. Consequently, the responsibility falls on these remarkable female traffic controllers representing the nation, approximately 50 of them in Pyongyang. According to Koryo Tours, these traffic cops receive better pay, more food, free housing, and health care, making this position highly sought after. Despite the challenging weather conditions, they remain at their posts, clad in pristine military uniforms. Kim Jong-il's affinity for these women is well documented, even providing them with new gear, including upscale platforms with umbrella covers. Their enhanced appearance and social standing make them desirable, leading to stiff competition for their affection. In 2013, one traffic girl received North Korea's highest military decoration, with speculation suggesting she inadvertently thwarted an assassination attempt while directing traffic, although the exact details remain unclear. Number 9. North Korean Computing System and Internet In the Democratic Republic of Korea, information access is strictly regulated, akin to controlling a weapon of mass destruction. Each computer must be registered with the police, and obtaining government permission to own one is necessary. However, the majority of North Koreans cannot even dream of computer ownership or internet access, given the stringent regulations. In larger cities, a small fraction of the population utilizes computer laboratories in offices, universities, and cyber cafes. North Korea's internet diverges significantly from other countries. It operates as an intranet, namely Kwang Myong or Bright Star. It resembles the internet of 1994, powered by pirated Japanese copies of Microsoft software. The main users are foreigners and the government, with limited broadband infrastructure, including fiber optic connections between major universities. The majority relies on the domestic only network, but a restricted number of users can access the worldwide internet. As of 2016, fewer than 30 websites are accessible, a list inadvertently discovered by an American engineer. It exposes the specific content permitted for North Korean internet users, primarily propaganda, official business, travel information, recipes, and North Korean films. These websites are slow-loading and simplistic. Some academic institutions, like the Pyongyang University of Science and Technology, provide limited access to the worldwide internet, albeit under strict supervision. North Korea banned South Korean content on popular platforms such as Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter in April 2016. Reports in January 2021 suggested North Korea was planning to transition from its current 3G to a 4G network. Number 8. Restricted Airwaves In North Korea, TV choices are quite limited, just four state-owned channels, so streaming your favorite Netflix or HBO shows is out of the question. They've even banned satellite television. These channels running from daytime to primetime cover a range of content. There's the Cable Line channel for live programming, the Sports Channel for sports enthusiasts, the Mansuti channel specializing in foreign country news, and the Central TV channel delivering significant political news. Back in the 90s, it was even more restrictive, just one channel on weekdays and two on weekends. Watching Western TV in North Korea? Risky business. It could land you in a labor camp. Expect content about diligent workers, devoted soldiers, the U.S. as an imperialist aggressor, South Korea as a puppet, and the remarkable feats of former North Korean leaders Kim Il-sung and Kim Jong-il. Media in North Korea has a predictable script. It kicks off by praising Kim Jong-un, highlighting global appreciation. Then the story shifts to critiquing the United States, done either bluntly or subtly. Beyond controlling what's on the airwaves, North Korean programs also dictate eating habits. The government insists that promoting good health and nutrition is the reason for recommending citizens stick to just two meals a day. However, there's skepticism about whether it's due to food shortages.
Number 7. Their Own Basketball Rules When the surprising friendship between Kim Jong-un and Dennis Rodman came to light, the world collectively raised an eyebrow. It turns out that the love for basketball runs deep in the North Korean leadership. Foreign policy claims Kim Jong-il went so far as to build a library with almost every Bulls game on film and installed full-size courts in most of his palaces. Even Secretary of State Madeleine Albright got in on the action, gifting the late Kim a signed basketball by Michael Jordan in 2000. Despite the basketball connection, Jordan opted out of a North Korea visit, leaving that privilege to Rodman. Kim Jong-un, the younger leader, showcased his basketball prowess during his school days in Switzerland, earning a reputation as a tough and fast, fiercely competitive player. But what's basketball without a touch of uniqueness? North Korea decided to put its spin on the game. While they play by the international rules in global competitions, the home court sees some intriguing modifications. According to the Herald Sun, slam dunks get you three points, and three-pointers score four if they manage to avoid the rim. The last three seconds of the game? Well, they're worth eight points, injecting a thrilling dose of unpredictability. Plus, missing a free throw costs a player a point, turning the strategy game on its head, depending on the score. In North Korean basketball, it seems they've found a way to make every point count in their distinctive style. Number 6. The Fake Village On the border between North and South Korea lies a fascinating tale of two villages that tell a story beyond their mere existence. The demilitarized zone, a 4-kilometer wide strip covering 250 kilometers, was established as part of the agreement following the Korean War in the 1950s. The deal mandated the demolition of all communities within, except for one village per nation. Enter Kijongdong or the Peace Village, a seemingly bustling settlement erected by North Korea. Reports claimed it boasted over 200 residents, complete with schools, a hospital, a kindergarten, and childcare facilities. From a distance, it looked like an ordinary village, people going about their daily lives. However, reality takes an unexpected turn. Kijongdong is nothing more than a masterfully crafted facade, a propaganda ploy to lure South Koreans across the border. Intriguingly, the Peace Village lacks actual inhabitants, except for a handful of caretakers occasionally spotted sweeping the streets. Rumors circulate that the buildings are hollow, lacking internal walls and floors. Despite its eerie emptiness, the village maintains a facade of normalcy, even illuminated at night. This elaborate scheme hasn't gone unnoticed. South Korean observers have confirmed the village's abandonment, discovering it is more Potemkin village than a thriving community. Yet, amidst the tension, an unexpected twist emerged. The village's loudspeakers, once used for broadcasting North Korean propaganda, became an unwitting platform for a cultural clash. In response, South Korea turned on its speakers, filling the air with the upbeat tunes of K-pop, a light-hearted counterpoint to the serious tones emanating from the North. Number 5 the cure for AIDS and Ebola. If you need cutting-edge medical treatment, a surprising destination to consider is North Korea. Despite its lag in various fields, the nation boasts a seemingly miraculous medication capable of addressing some of the deadliest illnesses known to humanity. Enter the Kumdang-2 vaccine, developed in 1996 according to the Korean Central News Agency, with reminders in 2006 and 2013, as reported by The Guardian. Originally designed to combat the Middle East Respiratory Disease, MERS, the vaccine expanded its repertoire to include treatment for an impressive range of conditions – diabetes, drug addiction, bird flu, AIDS, heart disease, impotence, the common cold, harm from use of computers, insomnia, epilepsy, cystitis, all forms of hepatitis, tuberculosis, various cancers, venereal disease, as well as offering resistance to aging and anti-radioactive properties. And that's not all. It claims effectiveness against SARS and Ebola because why not? North Korea proudly asserts to have clinical proof and to have administered this wonder drug to millions of people. The secret behind this marvel? It's manufactured from ginseng grown in a blend of gold, 
platinum, rare earth metals, and fertilizer, hopefully not sourced from human waste. For approximately $1.25, those beyond North Korea's borders can even purchase this extraordinary medication that, according to its claims, answers prayers. Interested? Check out the North Korean website for more details. Number 4. Religious Freedom in North Korea North Korea stands out for having some of the strictest restrictions on religious freedom globally. Despite constitutional claims, the reality is starkly different, rendering religious freedom practically non-existent. The country functions essentially as an atheist state, with severe persecution directed especially towards Christians, making it the most hostile place for religious believers worldwide. In the capital city of North Korea, Pyongyang, there are a handful of churches, but they operate under strict state control, serving as mere facades. This facade is further highlighted by Kim Jong-un's demand for unwavering allegiance, showcasing the true nature of religion in North Korea as a tool to maintain political control. The deliberate curtailment of religious freedom in the Constitution safeguards the political system from any perceived threat posed by religious ideologies. Research conducted by non-governmental organizations based on defector testimonies, estimates that around 70,000 Christians and followers of other religions are held captive in labor camps. The government actively encourages reporting on any illegal religious activities or possession of religious items, instilling fear among residents. Consequently, Christians often hide their religious practices from those around them, fearing persecution and accusations of disloyalty to the government. Disturbing incidents, such as the 2009 arrest of an entire family solely because of their religious beliefs and ownership of a Bible, highlight the extreme measures taken by the North Korean government. This family, including a two-year-old toddler, received life sentences in prison camps. Escapees from these camps have shared harrowing tales of acute malnourishment, forced ingestion of tainted food, verbal and physical abuse, and even execution. The struggle for religious freedom in North Korea remains a dire and ongoing challenge. Number 3. Controlled Hairdos In North Korea, your hairstyle isn't just a personal choice. It's subject to strict regulations. The government maintains a list of approved haircuts for both men and women, and stepping outside those boundaries can lead to disciplinary action. Forget about hair gel and spiked looks if you're a guy. Ladies, bobs, and layered cuts are a no-go. Visit a North Korean hair salon, and you'll find illustrated manuals showcasing the only hairstyles considered acceptable by the government. For instance, North Korean women can choose from a curated selection of 15 approved haircuts, varying options based on their marital status. Single ladies may flaunt longer curls, while married women are expected to keep it short. Surprisingly, North Korean men also have a menu of 15 officially recognized haircuts. There's a catch, though. Their hair shouldn't exceed 5 centimeters long, except for the older gents who get a bit more leeway with up to 7 centimeters. It gets even more intriguing when you learn that Kim Jong-un, the leader of North Korea, didn't always conform to these rules. In an effort to maintain his unique style, he reportedly instructed men to emulate his unconventional haircut. In 2015, rumors circulated that authorities went so far as to threaten forced haircuts for those who dared to defy these rules, especially at educational institutions where students were warned against adopting hairstyles associated with capitalism. It seems women were encouraged to take inspiration from Ri Solju, Kim's wife, and opt for a more conventional bob rather than replicating Kim's distinctively stylized look. Number 2. Freedom of Movement in North Korea In North Korea, moving around isn't as simple as deciding to pack your bags and go. The government here takes the phrase, restricted movement, to a whole new level. Picture this. You can't just hop between provinces or decide to take a spontaneous trip abroad. Nope. You need a green light from the authorities for that. Even family visits come with a paperwork party. Imagine having to show your certification from the local people's committee just to spend time with your folks. It's like filing paperwork for a family dinner. Bureaucratic hurdles at their finest. Now, if you're considering exploring the tourist spots, there aren't many. 
Mount Pek 2 and the super-secret Pek 2 camp, rumored to be Kim Jong-il's birthplace, are on the list. But it's not all fun and sightseeing. People from all walks of life, from farmers to model workers, are practically obliged to go on field visits. It's not necessarily a choice. It's more of a do-it-or-face-the-music situation. And it's not just the locals feeling the government's watchful gaze. Foreign visitors, especially relief workers, are under the microscope. No rogue adventures for them. Certain areas are off-limits, and straying from the approved path could spell trouble. Leaving the country without a thumbs-up from the powers that be? That's a one-way ticket to the ultimate punishment club. That is, the death penalty. Despite the risks, there are daredevils attempting a grand escape. But if luck isn't on their side, it's a horror show of beatings, hard labor, torture, and a front-row seat in a political prison camp. Border guards aren't exactly the welcoming committee. They're ordered to shoot first and ask questions later. Unfortunately, this policy has led to some heartbreaking incidents where desperate North Koreans are gunned down in their bid for freedom. Number 1. Energy Struggles Keeping the lights on in North Korea is not as simple as flipping a switch. Energy shortages are common, leading to frequent blackouts in many areas. A revealing snapshot from a NASA satellite in 2014 vividly captures the extent of the nation's struggle with insufficient electricity. North Korea, quite literally, isn't shining as brightly as its neighbors. In the 90s, the Soviet Union pulled the plug on North Korea's electricity supply, setting the stage for persistent energy woes. Unlike the well-lit scenes in China and South Korea, North Korea appears dimly lit, casting a shadow on its developmental image. Annual per capita power consumption tells a stark tale. North Koreans use a modest 739 kilowatt hours, a far cry from the 10,162 consumed by their counterparts in South Korea. The consequence? Early bedtimes and entire streets falling into darkness. In 2019, about 55% of North Korean households turned to solar panels to fill their energy needs. Take the city of Sinuiju, perched on the border with China. It enjoys a mere four hours of electricity daily despite the glaring energy deficit. Meanwhile, residents living in areas visible from China are encouraged to keep their lights burning through the night. The authorities have even provided instructions on generating personal power, all in an effort to create a facade of prosperity visible from the outside. So, as night falls over North Korea, it's not just bedtime. It's a plunge into darkness, with sporadic flickers of light hinting at a nation grappling with its energy challenges. Thanks for watching. Click the next video on your screen for more mind-blowing discoveries. See you there.